Now, we've got a lot to do today, so we're, I'm just going to uh, start right in. And I'm going to begin by introducing our very distinguished panelists, beginning with, on my left, Warren Buffett, the chairman and CEO of Berth Berkshire Hathaways, the world's, Warren's the world's best known and most successful investor. He's forgotten more about capital markets than most of us have ever, ever, ever learned to begin with. Uh, last night at dinner, I mentioned that if someone had invested $10,000 with Bor in Warren's per first private equity fund in 1958 and then rolled it into Berkshire Hathaway in, in 1965 and held on it through, to, through today, uh, he, would have, he or she would have more than $600 million. So uh, obviously, Warren's a good investor. He's also a man of extraordinary integrity, wisdom, and judgment always generous with his time and advice, always willing to help a CEO or a friend in need. And as I think a number of you know, this generosity has also extended to philanthropy with the considerable fruits of his life's work now going to humanity. Now on Warren's left is Jeff Ilmelt, the chairman and CEO of the General Electric Company, one of the truly outstanding leaders in American business today. Uh, Jeff is in the process of refocusing and restructuring GE to stay on the top of it in the 21st century economy. To Jeff's great credit, GE has just been rated by Fortune magazine as America's most admired company. Uh, on Jeff's left is a, another legend in capital markets, Chuck Schwab the founder, chairman, and CEO of Charles Schwab Corporation. He spent 35 years in capital markets. Uh, he's a pioneer, an entrepreneur, an innovator in serving individual investors. He built his company and successfully managed it for many years. And then a few years ago, he came back as CEO to reshape it for 21st century markets. Chuck Schwab. On, uh, on Chuck's left is Jamie Dimon. Jamie is the chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase and & Company, and he's another CEO who knows a great deal about competitiveness. After a distinguished career uh, with Sandy Weil, building and managing Shearshin up to and through its merger with Citigroup, Jamie then became the CEO of Bank One, restructuring the bank and merging it with J.P. Morgan Chase. And as is the case with a number of our other panelists today, Jamie is working to put his company on the cutting edge of competitiveness. Then on Jamie's left, we have Ann Yerger. Ann is the executive director of the Council of Institutional Investors. And after five years in domestic corporate banking at Wachovia, Ann has dedicated her career to advocating for and representing the interests of investors. After serving as a deputy director of the Corporate Governance Service, of the Investor Responsibility Research Center and was named Executive Director of the Council of Institutional Investors in January of 2005. And here she addresses investor issues for 140 corporate and public institutional investors uh, investing well over a trillion dollars. And then on her left, uh, last but not least, John Thane, the CEO of the NYS Group, and after a very distinguished 25-year career at a well-known investment bank, which will go unnamed, <laughs> John came to the NYSE at a time of great turmoil and is well along in his efforts to reshape the NYSE to the 21st century economy through its use of technology, the pending merger of Euronext, and a number of global alliances. And obviously, uh, on his left, we're very honored to have with us today, I'm very honored, as uh, co-moderator for these panels, uh, Chris Cox, the chairman of the SEC. And so let's um, get right, get going. And I, I will kick things off with a question to Warren. But l let me say to all of you what I had said to our, our panelists. With all this very distinguished talent here, uh, I, I thought we'd all be better served if rather than having individual speeches, we had a conversation, we had give and take. 
So I've asked people to keep their comments uh, relatively short, so we'll have time to hear from each of them on multiple occasions, and they'll have a chance to, uh, to respond to each other. So to kick things off, uh, Warren, uh, Berkshire Hathaway owns about 73 companies. Uh, many of them, most of them were private when you acquired them. Some of them are public. So you've, you've, been, you've been doing this for a long time. Now, as we look at the recent changes, Warren, we, we look at the, uh, uh, the new uh, corporate governance standards, uh, listing requirements, uh, some of the new regulatory requirements. This has been a major change, been a major change for private companies considering whether they should go public, major change for public companies. As you look at it all, and you've got a long-term perspective, a long-term lens you look through, how long, how, how well do you think corporate America is doing in terms of digesting these changes? How long do you think it will take? And what would be your view as to the, uh, the impact on our competitiveness, uh, again, longer term? Well, I, th I, th I think it's, it's digesting, but it has no choice but to uh, digest what's being uh, served up. Uh, it, um, most of my friends are not overly happy about the degree, uh, but in some, in, in some senses it was, you know, they brought it on themselves. The, the corporate America in the 1990s uh, did not deliver a magnificent account of itself, and, and the reaction in terms of legislation and regulation uh, has been quite understandable. I mean, I, it's a little like if I go out to the golf, uh, golfing and I hit two balls out of bounds on the left, you know, the caddy's going to tell me to aim a little right the next time. And uh, uh, the world has told American business <clears throat> they want them to aim a little right here for a while to atone for those out of bounds shots in the 90s. Uh, I'm both a user and a preparer of, 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 of financial information. And as a user, of course, I'm, I got an enthusiasm for reading reports. It's a little like a teenager has for reading Playboy. So I'm, I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, at 76, you got to get excited about something. I mean, they, uh, <laughs> so I, I love it on that side of it. As, as, a, as a preparer, there's no question, we spent $24 million last year on audit fees plus lots of internal costs. I probably have a greater interest uh, from both a financial and a reputational standpoint of having the best job done possibly in terms of preparing our books. And I don't think it would have cost me $24 million to get the information that was necessary for our board and our owners and for myself. So we are doing a lot of things that I regard as, as unnecessary. It, 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 it has changed the complexion uh, even in the boardroom of, of what gets discussed. I, I recruited uh, a young woman, Susan Decker, to be on our board recently. And fortunately, she said yes. But, but before she said yes, she said, uh, Warren, I want a prenuptial agreement. Now, it's a little unusual when the woman asked for a prenuptial agreement. But, uh, and I said, what's that? And she says, no audit committee. Uh, and uh, you know, she would be a terrific audit committee member. She, you know, she knows the subject back and forth, but she is she has had the experience where hours and hours and hours get spent on process without much reality taking place. So it's, it's had an effect, I think, in, in making board membership, uh, you know, never the most exciting thing in the world, but it, it, it's, made it, it's made it somewhat more tedious and probably somewhat less productive. I would say that the process that's gone through detracts from, uh, from more important issues that a board should be looking at. Jeff, uh, as you look at all the change, what has been the most challenging aspect of the change for GE? And maybe go from GE, and then if you, you've got a comment, just in, in, in general. You know, Hank, what I would say is that uh, there's nothing really wrong about uh, regulation. You know, in other words, we compete in the healthcare industry, the aviation industry, so we deal with the FDA, the FAA. And having high standards is not inherently a bad thing for business. In other words, I would argue it's actually a good thing. It actually can make you more competitive. I think there are elements, Hank, of uh, SOX 404 that actually drive success in the system, process advantages in the system. But I think that uh, what, I, 
would argue for is not less regulation as much as just balance and judgment back in the system. Inside the company, and to draw an analogy, I know Georgetown's got a good basketball team. You know, I, I tell the guys at GE, uh, you know, we don't complain about the refs, at least in public we don't. You know, we, we might in private, but, but we, don't, we don't make a policy of complaining about the refs. But I think if you sit and look at unintended consequences, the one I would pick on or the one I would point out is the uh, role of the independent auditor. You know, for decades, the independent auditor has provided comfort to audit committees and boards and investors. And, you know, at the end of the day, look, uh, I love the G investors. I love the company. I, I want to protect our investors, as does the board. And I think the independent auditor no longer plays that role. The, the, the independent auditor no, no longer can provide comfort to audit committees or boards. Uh, their advice has been in some ways uh, downgraded because of rules that are just too gosh darn complex and the fact that their judgments are no longer held in necessarily high regard. And so I'm not here today to whine or complain or, or cry about regulation. What I would say is that there's been an unintended consequence. I don't think anybody ever intended this to be the case. It says that a group that has historically played a very strong role, pro-investor role, has been largely discounted in a system that's just too gosh darn complex and where too many judgments get second guessed. Not for a cheating CEO, but, but, but what reasonable people are trying to accomplish. And I, I just think, Hank, that's got to be that's got to be changed. That's just got to be changed. Other comments? People agree, disagree with Warren, Jeff, other viewpoints? You know, Hank, I'd like to hear from Ann because she's representing now uh, both public uh, and corporate investors union. and union investors. And as we all know, in capital markets, if investors ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. So I want to hear from you whether or not first uh, these uh, uh, creeping pathologies that we're hearing about are of concern to you. Second, I'd like to know whether or not uh, you get as excited about reading SEC disclosure materials as Warren Buffett does. I do, I do. <laughs> well, let me just make a few comments. First and foremost, I think that we can't forget where we were five years ago. There was a remarkable crisis of confidence in the integrity of our marketplace. And I think rightfully so, corporate leaders, Exchange, the exchanges, uh, regulators, Congress stepped up in very important and necessary ways, I think, to restore a sense of trust in the marketplace. And I think, I fear we're sort of losing touch with that period of time, and that's why these regulations were put in place, and they were necessary, and I think they've made great strides in terms of helping folks feel more comfortable and confident um, in, the, in the gatekeepers in our markets. There was great disappointment in boards of directors. Um, there was a general sense that boards were not doing their jobs as overseers and representatives of owners. And I think we've come a long way in that area. Um, I think that the rules formalized what had been best practices at the best companies. So to a certain extent, what's the big deal? Let's just step up. I think all companies should be embracing gold standards for their practices. The auditors failed investors also. Um, there was a general sense that they had become more consultants to firms. They weren't being auditors. They weren't asking the difficult questions. And I think that's changed, um, probably in a good way. I think where the investor community is concerned right now is, first, a general sense that maybe the regulations have gone too far. I think we would disagree with that. I think there's some skepticism about the statistics that are being used to um, promote some of the changes to the capital markets, like the IPO stats, which I hope we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, I think there's some skepticism. Companies are pressing back on auditors, saying we have, we're paying you too much, fees are too high, and at the same time, they're talking about capping their uh, liability. And I'm not sure how investors win uh, with that particular uh, setup. So I think we've got challenges. Um, and I agree, this is all about balancing, um, but I think it's very important we not lose sight of the investors as we're thinking through these issues. And I, I wonder if I could get you also to help us understand contextually what our regulation in the United States looks like in the broader world. Obviously, the investors that you represent are increasingly investing in hedge funds. They're investing in uh, increasingly exotic instruments. They're certainly investing in foreign securities, and they're investing in developing markets. CalPERS recently said that uh, it's going to invest in China. 
uh, given that other countries, and certainly developing markets, have different standards and uh, uh, across the board, I think it's fair to say, not as high standards as the United States, why is it that your investors are uh, requiring uh, themselves to diversify out of the United States? And, and how do the changes that we're talking about in the United States uh, impact our competitiveness globally? Well, let me just give you a snapshot of the average council fund, which is generally a pension plan. The average fund has a very significant commitment to our U.S. capital markets. About 75% of their portfolios are invested in stocks and bonds of U.S. publicly traded companies. Somewhere north of 10, maybe 15% are now in international stocks, and then the remainder in sort of these alternative classes, private equity, hedge funds, um, real estate. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of, of, of instruments that are placed in that basket. Um, the fact is that our members have sort of gradually been increasing their exposure overseas um, for diverse, logical diversification reasons, but I also think there's been caution because they don't feel that their rights are as strong as they are, as, as, as they are here in the United States. Um, certainly there are, w regarding the alternative investment classes, there's different types of oversight, um, those are different vehicles, they're much riskier, and they understand that they're very sophisticated investors. So they're not expecting that a hedge fund is going to be regulated to the extent that a publicly uh, traded company is, and I think that's, that's putting things in a little bit of context. Uh, Chuck, like Ann, uh, although uh, in a retail context, uh, you've got a lot of investor interest yourself, I and mean, that's the heart of your business. From an investor standpoint, putting on your investor's hat, how do you see these things? Well, when I look at and think about capital markets, uh, certainly I'm looking at it through the lens of probably two-thirds of our population in America has some interest in stocks, mutual funds, and so forth. Uh, we are very much of an individualist investor population. We can really be happy about that. We're all sort of capitalists at heart, and so the capitalist system really goes right down to this fundamental unit of the individual investor, and that's, of course, what I spend a lot of time thinking and worrying about. And they want, uh, more than anything else, is have confidence in our institution. And how do we get there? They also want to have fair returns. And so they're looking at American uh, capital markets, they're looking at international capital markets, they're looking at private equities, they're looking at everything out there. and and and. For an investor, really, the fundamental thing for them really is getting an adequate return with appropriate information, appropriate transparency, all of the things that we talk about. But many of the regulations that we have this day, I don't think they have any standard at all about does it really do something good for the corporation? Because we know corporations really are, in some sense, were wonderful creations of several hundred years ago for the benefit of creating an economic unit. They're not set up as a so-called democratic unit as such. It's not a democracy. A corporation is set up to get, raise capital, reduce risk, and so forth, and get returns for their investors. That's what a corporation is all about, frankly. And you want them to do it within an ethical framework within, uh, of course, our country here. Uh, but uh, individual investors are looking at this, assessing this all the time, that have we gone too far? Has our regulation gone way too far, and hence, their investments are means are suffering, is uh, uh, and then regulation then turns into litigation, and the cost uh, of litigation for the individual investor through the diminution of his investment or her investment is pretty significant. The companies that get attacked from time to time, I have seen no benefit really for the individual investor, but a lot of benefit for the lit litigants. So, it's uh, Chris. Uh, the individual investor is, of course, really interested in, in a healthy capital markets, but uh, they want to have a balance. Yep. John. Well, I want to go back to um, some of the things that Ann said, because I think there's no question that if we go back five or six years, there was a loss of investor confidence and a loss of trust in the marketplace. And many of the changes that have been made in the market, uh, both uh, Sarbanes-Oxley, changes in the exchange rules on uh, co corporate boards, independence requirements, et cetera, have gone a long way to restore investor confidence and trust in the marketplace. And I think that um, for the most part those changes are good. Uh, and there's no question that the U.S. financial markets are still the leading financial markets in the world, are the most liquid, the most transparent, and the most innovative. 
But there are signs that we need to be concerned about the competitive position of the U.S. capital markets, and you referenced the st statistics, which I'll now use. Um, it is a sign of concern when, in 2005, of the 25 largest initial public offerings in the world, only one was registered in the United States. And that trend uh, was much better in 2006, where two of the top 25 IPOs in the world uh, were listed in the United States. And the reason for those, um, for that decline, and if you go back five or six years, in, in uh, 2000, nine out of 10 of the largest IPOs in the world were listed in the US. So there's definitely something going on here that we have to be concerned about. And the topic of this uh, conference really addresses at least four of the five reasons for that. Um, the first is Sarbanes-Oxley, and Sarbanes-Oxley did a lot of good. And, and even the 404 part, of course we want companies to have good internal controls. But the way that 404 was implemented, even though most companies would say, yes, there were benefits, the cost greatly exceeded the benefit. And as Chuck just mentioned, the litigation environment in this country is deterring international companies from coming here. The cost of class action lawsuits in the U.S. is a burden on all companies here, but companies that can avoid the U.S. and avoid the, the uh, risk of uh, class action lawsuits will do so if they can. Third area, which we've talked a little bit about already, but there will be more talk about, is the, is the excessive and duplicative regulatory regimes in the U.S., particularly competition both between federal regulators and federal and state regulators. The fourth reason is the lack of accounting convergence, and actually I think we're going to make good progress on that. Uh, the fact is uh, we should accept uh, full IFRS in the U.S., uh, and I think there's li it's likely we're going to get there. And the last reason is the rest of the world has matured. And so you can raise billions of dollars and not enter the U.S. marketplace, whether it's in London or in Hong Kong. The fact is we are in a different environment where the U.S. does have to be more competitive because companies don't have to come here anymore. And Jamie, how do you look at all of this? Well, uh, first I feel a little bit like the guy who was giving the advice when he's going to go play poker and he doesn't know the suckers at the table. <laughs> it's you. Um, <laughs> And unlike Jeff, who has the FDA and the FAA who are not here, I have all my head regulators here. The Fed's here, the OCC here, the SEC is here. Uh, and, but I'm not going to take the fifth. Uh, you know, I, I, I guess my, the main point, this country is always, one of the beautiful things about it is always reformed. And it's always had problems and it's always reformed. And I think that's a rational thing. Always, how can we get better? And so I think, and we all, because we all, people write sometimes like we don't, we need good regulation. We need good policy. We believe in good enforcement. I'm not sure, and I think, I agree with Warren, we all earned a lot of this attention we're getting, though it's a little unfair to paint everything with the same brush. And I think if someone did a study, and maybe a student here will do it, I'm not sure the scandals in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 00s, the 010s, the 50s, the 40s were that different, okay? And yet we do sometimes react and overreact. And I think John said it perfectly. It's not Sarbanes-Oxley. That's just kind of an overlay of stuff, kind of an added cost. It had some benefits. It had some negatives. Though I'm always uh, surprised when people say, well, Sarbanes-Oxley is a great thing, but it should apply to those companies, but not those companies. It's a great thing. It should apply to everybody. And I think our capital markets are excellent. I think, uh, uh, and we should always keep that in mind. Um, but I think it is the confluence of Sarbanes-Oxley litigation uh, uh, constant changes in accounting. You know, Jeff mentioned accounting. Well, you know, some lawsuits were, were, were filed, and, and basically the precedent being set is that underwriters and other people involved in companies cannot rely on the audit. That was the outcome. So therefore, you have to do your own audit again, and what it should have been, you can rely on the audit and have something reasonable that we can all, all believe in. So, and we have, and also we have a mishmash in this country of regulation, state AGs, uh, you know, we've got Basel II coming down. So now I think is the perfect time to sit back, come up with some policies, rules, and regulations, which are nonpartisan, which are not protecting companies, which are better for everybody, and keep, you know, this beautiful economic machine called the United States running properly. Jamie, you're the third of our panelists to mention litigation. You do business in over 60 countries around the world. You have an opportunity to see the impact of high standards, our rule of law in this country, other high standards countries that have different approaches and other countries that simply don't have our respect for the rule of law, how would you rate the importance of the legal system in each country in which you operate uh, to the overall benefit to, to the investor? 
Right. So the legal system is very complicated because I'll come back to the United States in one second, but you underwrite a bond in the UK. You know, what's the law that's going to play? If it's a German company, is it US, UK, German? And they're all different. So, you know, they're trying to come to a convergence in, the, in Euro, Euro land, which is reasonable. You know, the United States, I remember we were doing due diligence in a company once years ago in Britain, and we asked to see the litigation files. And the person said, what files? And we said, litigation files. And he said, oh, you mean like lawsuits? And he came out with two lawsuits. And, and in this country, we would have had to give him a busload that would more than fill this room. And personally, I think it is a, and I, I don't think there's really justice to it anymore. I think the class action suits are kind of a crapshoot. And it's a, it's a one-sided crapshoot, by the way. Big companies can only lose, they can't win. And plaintiffs can only win, they can't lose. In fact, I don't think they win at all. I could look, if we were all shareholders of a company and we did something wrong or something like that, would we start suing each other uh, to recollect from each other? The only real winners here are some of the outside lawyers. I will also point out that in all the lawsuits you talked about, not one lawyer got punished. Okay, no lawyer went to jail that I know of. And, um, uh, and remember, they signed off on bond counts and stuff like that. Uh, so I think it's a very big deal. And I also think it's striking at the heart of the best part of America, which is, you know, we're making everyone a victim. There are no good losses anymore. Something goes wrong, you sue. And it's a, it's a terrible kind of thing. It's demoralizing. You know, I have doctor friends who are leaving the business, not because of the, the cost of uh, medical insurance, because they could afford that and charge more to, you know, uh, have, a, uh, have a baby. It's because of the demoralization that they have to go through the process just even once. And so I do think it's a big deal. It's got to it's got to become fair, and uh, and it's and it's so large, and you know no one's going to take these things to the juries. We also have juries dealing with. I think if we got all the smartest people in this room, and asked you to deal with some of these antitrust uh, lawsuits and class action suits, are very complex networks and 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 pharmaceuticals and stuff, it would be really hard to have the answer, and you can't afford to get the answer because some jury somewhere. You know, we just get mad at someone large and they look at some irrelevant fact and they punish you. So I think it's a very big deal. And if they write the book called The Rise and Fall of America, the fall will be because of the legal system, which made it a great company, country, but it's, it's really just gone too far. On your one point about holding lawyers accountable, I'll, I'll just add that I made a speech a few days ago at Georgetown University Law School describing the SEC's recent actions to do just that, to hold lawyers accountable. Uh, we have taken enforcement actions in these cases, including very recently, focusing on the conduct, the conduct of the lawyers. I think I'm going to sue uh, Jamie because I think he's ready to settle. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> How much do you want? And, and, and Warren, speaking about that, you might uh, uh, talk a little bit about the, the philosophy you have on your board and. Uh, the way you think about director insurance and the way you think about these lawsuits. And yeah, our, our, our directors do not have DNO insurance. Uh, we want them all to have a substantial uh, investment in Berkshire. We want them to profit or loss, uh, profit or uh, gain or lose uh, with the shareholders and not off the shareholders. So uh, they get paid nominal fees and uh, they never miss a meeting. We've never have asked anyone to become a director that didn't accept, even though our $900 a year uh, fee seems a little light to some, perhaps. Uh, but we, I, 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 want, I, want the, I want the directors to be in our shareholders' shoes, 100%. I want them to be savvy about business. There are plenty of smart people who are, who are uh, an absolute cipher on, on boards. I've been on 19 boards, uh, public boards, over, over time. And they're perfectly wonderful f people, but it would be like me being on a medical board or something of the sort. I, you know, I wouldn't know what was going on, and I, I would accept any explanation that somebody gave me. Uh, so I think they have to be business savvy. I want them interested in the company, and I want them shareholder-oriented. And their main job, you know, basically, is to have the right CEO, although I will get a little less firm in that view as I get older, but the, uh, uh, and, and to make sure the CEO isn't overreaching, and that requires some effort even with some very good CEOs sometimes, I and mean, the CEO really has a different uh, position uh, uh, in respect to the company and, and when you get to the issue of compensation. And, and uh, it's, I've never, I was only on a compensation committee once uh, for some reason, uh, you know, they look, they look usually more for Cocker Spaniels than for Dobermans. <laughs> and, uh, um, 
So I, I have not been frequently nominated for that position. Um, but it's, it, it is important, it is important that somebody brings to the compensation committee uh, uh, the, same, the same thing I bring. We, I, I'm the compensation committee for 41 people at, at, at Berkshire, the people who run our various businesses. And I represent the owners and they represent themselves and we never have any real problems in, in, in working things out. But I am there to represent the owners. And I think that that has been lacking certainly in the past in, in, in terms of uh, m many compensation committees. Uh, um, so it's, uh, it's not as much fun being on, on boards anymore though. I mean, our board does have fun. I mean, we talk about nothing but business issues and we get through the process uh, pretty fast. It's not as much fun being on our audit committee uh, uh, because there, that is hours and hours of things that are really, in my view, uh, non-productive. But our main job is to make sure that Berkshire has the people in place to run things for the next 10, 20, 50 years. And I think our share, our directors all expect to own every share they have until they die, unless they give it away for uh, philanthropic purposes. So it's a, it's a board with a very long-term outlook. Uh, it's a board that I've never heard anything but the shareholders' interest be discussed in. But I would say that has not been true of a number of the other boards I've been on. I, I would I would echo what Warren said. I, I think in reading some of the press surrounding uh, this event or some of the things Commissioner Cox has done, there's this sense that what business wants is a massive rollback of what's uh, been done. I don't think that's right. I think it's up to people like Jamie and me to, whatever the world is, adjust our companies to compete successfully in this, in this uh, world. And I'd say whatever the regulation is today, I can still win in China. I can still win in India. I'm not complaining one bit, nor is our board, nor is anybody that works for our company. But I think as you sit here today, what everybody ought to be asking themselves is what truly is in the best interest of investors? I, I think that is ultimately the question that every one of us on this panel have to be put through, which is what is, you know, what, what do we want boards doing? What do we want management teams doing? What do we want the regulator doing? And ultimately, what is in the best interest of our investors? It's, it's uh, you know, I work without a contract. Our board is totally focused on doing what's right. I, we're complaining not at all. But I do think it's a, it's a worthwhile debate around this topic that says, is the, where is the pendulum? And what really benefits uh, uh, the people that own these companies? And, you know, I, I think our board is like Warren's board. It is totally fixated on the long-term success of the company for the benefit of our investors, our customers, and our employees. I'd say, Hank, uh, in the world of the internet, uh, presently and going forward, I see enormous flows of capital by individuals making decisions about their investments. And there's a very noticeable, huge amount of influx of an interest in investing internationally. And being able to do that Ease more easily, smoothly, and so forth, without a lot of the encumbrances. And things are happening in the capital markets to make those improvements along the way. But I have to say, in all my meetings, going around the country and seeing many of our clientele, uh, not one of them has ever come up to me and said, I'm buying this international fund. What do you think about the rules and regulations behind that particular company in Germany or in Spain or in England? They don't care. They, they care more about you know, it's, it seemed like a trustworthy company or a trustworthy fund and so forth, and they buy it or they sell it, whatever might be of their interest. But I think at the bottom of the line there, they're, they're more interested in the returns and not as interested really in how regulated or over-regulated they are. They're more interested in the net returns. And I think that's going to be true. And so it, what we're talking about here is the competitiveness of American markets, making sure we don't get ourselves encumbered in so much of a web that we aren't competitive in the vis-a-vis -vis in the world marketplace as it's unfolding very, very quickly. Well, and I just have to argue that I think we still are very competitive. And I know that the stats in terms of non-US companies doing IPOs here in this marketplace are on the decline, but they have been since 1996. So I think in a way it, it's, it, it's an ongoing trend that I think is largely due to the fact that Liquidity worldwide has increased, the sophistication and capabilities of other marketplaces have increased, and now companies can quickly and attractively raise capital in their local markets, and that's where they're going. 90% of these companies are generally listing in their local markets, 
And I think the reason for that is largely um, that companies prefer being local. And I think that makes a lot of sense. That's a trend that I don't know how we can overcome, um, frankly. So I think I just don't want us to be fixating on that statistic alone as sort of evidence that we've got problems in our marketplace. I do want to make one comment about securities litigation, and I'm not here to be an apologist for uh, the, the class action bar um, by, by no stretch of the imagination. But I do want us to remember that Congress, the SEC, the Supreme Court, have, they've recognized private rights of action as sort of an important supplement. The fact is we have so many companies, so many securities, there's just no way sort of the cops on the beat can do that on their own. And securities litigation properly used is, is one mechanism for doing that. I think we all agree that frivolous litigation, whether it's securities class action litigation or any kind of litigation, is harmful to society as, as, at, at large. I also want to note that over 10 years ago, Congress enacted the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act to try to cut back on frivolous suits, and that seems to be working. The stats are that these cases are going down, dismissals are going up, um, institutional investors are stepping up, um, and they're doing a better job in terms of getting recovery and also getting recovery from the real wrongdoers. So I think that it's not all bad news when it comes to securities litigation. And to, to get to, to your point on you know, IPOs in the US, uh, let me let me drill a little deeper, because when, when I looked at that, looked at the issue, one, one of the reasons for the uh, for the decline was we have stronger, broader, deeper, more competitive markets outside of the U.S. And in and of itself, that's a good thing. It's a good thing for the U.S. It's a good thing for economies outside of the U.S. So, the, the, but then you get to the question. Uh, if there are reasons why people don't want to come to the U.S., are those, are, are, you know, are those factors impacting the competitiveness of U.S. companies here? And w w one thing that we'd looked at pretty carefully was the number of private companies going public in the U.S. relative to where we were in, in, in the economic expansion, and, and, and it, it looked like that was below trend. And then looking at the number of public companies going private. And there could be a number of things driving that. There are big pools of, of, of capital. There's high levels of liquidity. But, but I'd just be interested asking uh, other members on this committee, or, or you or anyone on the, on the committee, uh, or not the committee, the, uh, the, the panel here. You know, I got committees on the brain, right? Too much time in government. But, 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 the, but, but the, uh, but is it a, is it a ne negative that that the bar is being raised for for private companies looking to go public? Is that is that a negative or is that a positive? Or how, how do you think about it? Well, yeah. you know, again, I think the big trend is the other one, Hank. In other words, you know, look, if, if let me just public companies going private. I mean, the students out there. If I said to you, okay, you can you can make more money. Um, you don't have to work as hard, and there's no quarterly earnings. Who's coming with me? <laughs> you know, it's a, and that's, a, you know, and that's, and that's, you know, I, I sit there and just want to cry sometimes. And, and you, you, know? you lost one of your really key guys. Well, to, to among, among others, yeah. you know, so I, I, look, and now, whether or not that's true or not, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I just think there's a, we're, we're just at this moment in time that that is uh, being played up as being the new nirvana of business. And just like everything else, it kind of, it kind of runs its course. But I think it, it is merchandised as being a great thing to not have the scrutiny of public markets and being able to have a longer term view or less regulation in, in private markets. Now, I don't know how you make money ultimately unless you go public again. So you know, I don't know how the story ends exactly. You know, Hank, I think we're still in the first quarter of a four quarter game in terms of how it gets played. But I, I think it's being merchandised that way. And again, I, I come back to, um, we don't have to think about regulation as being a negative. I, I think balance and judgment, you know, balance and judgment. If, if we can keep driving that, there is, you know, I love my job. I love running a public company. I love my company. I have no complaints. Just balance and judgment. And then I, I, I think a lot of these things uh, get marginalized. But those going private now and explaining all these reasons why it's wonderful to be private and terrible to be public, 
will in a few years have what I call a counter-revelation, and they will then explain to the markets why it's now wonderful to go public, <laughs> and that they're doing investors a great favor by taking these co companies public into this better environment. So I, I think you, I think the uh, the arguments sort of uh, adapt themselves to the self-interest of the pre person talking. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I don't think it's the uh, private equity uh, space that's really the concern here because if you look at the, even last year, e even where we're in the cycle, uh, almost half of all the initial public offerings that listed on the New York Exchange came from private equity shops. And so I, I think it's much more the competitive position of the U.S. marketplace in the world. And the, the, the capital markets are truly global and companies can raise money across the globe and they can raise a lot of money. And so. That is the reason why we do have to be more concerned about our competitive position. And I think it is a matter of balance and judgment and getting the regulatory environment right because we do want to have very high standards uh, for our uh, companies. We want to have high standards of corporate governance, of transparency, et cetera. Uh, but we also have to be aware of the fact that companies have choices. And we do want to make sure that we are not over-regulating or over-litigating uh, in a way that discourages companies from accessing this marketplace because that's not good for U.S. investors. U.S. investors should have access to these companies and if we push them outside the U.S. because of over-regulation, over over, over, over the over-litigiousness litigious, of this, of this uh, country, that's not going to be good for investors. Yeah, I have a, you know, I, I think I hear y your comments, uh, based upon the comments you've made, that, that I would it sure sounds like you would agree, the panelists would agree, that the three areas we've, we've, we've selected to focus on, regulatory structure, regulatory philosophy, do we have the balance right between protecting investors and, and staying competitive, uh, the, the accounting uh, industry and, and the relationship of accountants with, with boards, and the legal environment. I'd like to, to go to a, uh, to a related topic that, that, that impacts a, a couple of these areas, which is there's, there's a lot of conversation about rules-based versus principles-based. Now, I, I know those, those, those are extreme because it's hard to imagine, you know, a, a, a system without rules. So I guess where are we on that spectrum and are the rules principles-based? And, you know, we, we've, we've talked about that with regard to, uh, to regulatory structure. Uh, it's it, it's more difficult when you've got multiple regulators, but is, is, this, is this something that's practically possible or desirable? And then we could raise the same issue when, when we look at accounting. As I've, I've heard people talk about rule upon rule upon rule and, 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 and black and white and, 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 and so on. But, but be interested in that, uh, comments on those two, you know, both regulation and accounting principles versus rules and where on the spectrum we are and where we should be. You may need a law professor up here because my general feeling without being uh, really knowing the subject that well, but I would think it would be a very difficult in our legal system to have a principles-based uh, approach. I mean, I, I don't know what would be happening in the courtroom when, uh, when uh, you were trying to defend yourself uh, and say, well, I really was doing things marvelously and according with principles, but uh, I, I, think, I think this legal system sort of demands rules, but I, I, I defer to anybody that's had more experience with it, and I don't want more experience with it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Hank, I, I'll talk just for a moment on the accounting side. Uh, I, I think there's no question that you have to have both. You, you can't have a purely principle, in our, in our system, you can't have a purely principle-based approach. It has to be principles but with rules. And, you know, Jeff, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but, but I know that you have a great example of an extreme instance of applying rules as opposed to principles as it relates to hedge accounting. And it's just, uh, there are, and I, look, I, it's not just Jeff, it, it, many companies uh, talk about uh, how rather than going to the principles of the accounting treatment and, and what the company is clearly trying to do, there is a tremendous over-reliance on very, very technical aspects of the rules that then come up with the wrong answer. And so I, I think we definitely have to push back more towards the principles and less towards the detailed elements of the technicalities of the rules, which 
it's our, most of the people don't even understand, and um, and it's not even clear what the right answer is. No, I mean I would just I, I would go back to the point on uh, independent audit to say accounting uh, much of accounting is uh, rules based and some of accounting is judgment based, and the extent to which it's judgment based, um, you have to have principles that people can adhere to without. Uh, being second-guessed in an overt way. So I, I just think you need both, but there has to be judgment applied, and that judgment has to be respected. And so I just, uh, I think, that's the, I think that's, the, that's the challenge. You know, in the end, we'll play the game however it's prescribed. But I, I, I just think that once upon a time, there was this thing called independent auditors. And they were relied upon by boards to have judgments that were intact. To Ann's point, you know, they were some of the culprits of some of the big issues that took place. But I think that, you know, Hank, if one thing came from today or the U.S. Chamber report that I, you know, is just where is the role of the independent auditor going to go and the extent to which can they can they be the ones that have principle-based judgments uh, that uh, audit committees can count on? What would principles-based accounting have led to in terms of option expensing? Take a, to take a practical example, uh, the, the, the uh, you know. No, but, you, I, but, I, but look, Warren, I, I think that uh, option expensing and, and, uh, and there were many FASB panels over that time period that could have come out either either way. Yeah, well, the, the FASB actually took the position after they got muscled that the that it was preferable to account uh, uh, for them, uh, 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 but they allowed the other, and two of the 500 S&P 500 companies elected to account for the, in the preferable way, and 498 elected to account in a way that, that gave them greater earnings. So. I just wonder where it would lead if you start getting into saying we're going to have principles on something Nine, like that. 900 pages of regulation that is currently what is called hedge accounting. Okay? <laughs> I agree with that. that. You know, 900 pages that five experts can't agree on what's true. And, and I just think, you know, you can give one extreme, I can give the other. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. And I don't think in the end, you know, I come back to, don't worry about Jeff Immelt. Yeah. I, I'm irrelevant in this thing. The investor. I, I come back to, I'm irrelevant. I, I, I'm here to serve the company and the investor. My feelings don't matter at all, at all. But, but you know, 900 pages that five PhDs have no clue what they mean, the investor gets hurt in that. And I just I, think I, that's wrong. Yeah, I do think accounting is a big deal because, and I agree with John, we need better rules. For example, most of us who buy companies, the first thing we do is look what they look like on our accounting. So you can account for the exact same thing completely differently at different companies. I personally think that's wrong. I think that, you know, the way you handle certain stuff, should, it should be told, the regulators should say what it is, and everyone does it that way, or the accountants. And uh, uh, on, on the other hand, I agree with Warren, you know, principles, but they could be fully disclosed. I think the shareholder would have been fine and I agree options should have been expensed if they, if they actually knew uh, all the truth about it. And, you know, one of the things years ago, like this hedge accounting stuff, and I think what Jeff is referring to is a lot of companies have had a restate, which is embarrassing, uh, on very arcane rules, which were really insignificant, based upon things known after the fact, when their accountants completely signed off on it. And no one was trying to pull the wall over the eye. So, like years ago, when we, and matter of fact, before Secretary Cox was, uh, Chairman Cox was in his job, you know, there's this very complex derivative accounting rule. Half the firms in the street did it one way, half the firms did it the other way, and our people said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, hell, I don't want to do it wrong. Why don't we go ask the SEC? And the answer we got back is, they can't tell us. <laughs> and, you know, I think that's not right either, because I'm like Jeff, you know, just, it's, it's a, well, no, no one's trying to pull the, the wool over someone's eyes, but let's, we could do both better and it would be meaningful, including international accounting standards. You know, this way. debate about principles versus rules is, at least within the American context, a little bit like tastes great and less filling. We want the best of both. Uh, Congress in repeated enactments has directed the SEC 
most recently in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, to aggressively move to study and talk about the implementation of and schedule the implementation of a move to principles-based rather than rules-based accounting, uh, and the SEC has, in fact, done that. So the real question is not so much whether or not we can uh, move in that direction. Enron taught us that following the rules punctiliously is not the way to truth. Uh, but rather whether or not we can integrate with a world that surely is slightly more principles-based than is the U.S. system. And so uh, given that we are focused here on global competitiveness of the U.S. system, uh, given that uh, John has mentioned IFRS is something that the United States should be open to, uh, maybe I ought to ask from the investor's standpoint, uh, what would you like to see ultimately in the way of global comparability? What kind of a system should we be building towards? Just very quickly, I'm, I think the institutional community is very much in favor of convergence and I think even comfortable with the elimination of the, re the reconciliation. Um, I think my concern right now is more for the individual investor who may not sort of understand what the differences are uh, in, the, in the treatments. I think there needs to be a lot more education for the investors on this issue, but I think there's broad support institutionally um, for this movement. I think everyone applauds it. It's, a, it's in the best interest of everyone in the marketplace. Maybe there should be uh, several segments of markets, Chris. Uh, Sarbanes compliant companies trade in a separate market. Non-compliant companies trade in another market and other kinds of companies trade in another market. And let the, uh, let the competitors buy and sell and see how the consumer, the investor, figures this all out for us. Let the marketplace determine the valuations, not necessarily have regulators determine it or litigants Determine, let the marketplace determine. Might be a better way to go uh, as we move forward, since capital really has no borders. It moves very, very quickly. And we have to be very careful that we don't sort of sit here and uh, define for something that the marketplace might define completely differently than ourselves. Well, let me ask you, because uh, I, I do recognize the, the it's it's very very difficult to have the principles uh, versus rules discussion in the abstract, and you know you can argue that you you you, you can argue that both ways. Although any of us that have signed off on financial statements and understood financial statements re recognize that we we see instances where we have to have had to report in a way which we didn't think. Uh, had much to do with economic reality. And yet, I, I think the, the, the general public wants to look at the financial statements and say it's either right or wrong. And, but l let me, m more broadly, as we've talked about this and, and thought about competitiveness, uh, what, uh, w w what, are, what are we missing? What, what are the, uh, um, are, are there something major we've missed something outside when we when we talk about u.s competitiveness more broadly uh what 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 else should we should we be focusing on as yeah, we yeah, i think you have to start out with the fact that that corporate profits as a percentage of gdp at well over eight percent are just about the highest you know in the history of the united states and return on tangible equity of american major american corporations is also at about the highest in history. So, uh, you know, if, if something's wrong with the system, it hasn't seeped through uh, to the actual operating results of business. Business results have been uh, almost incredible uh, in, in recent years. And uh, you, can, you can look at the uh, uh, charts that for decades and decades, corporate profits were between four and 6% of GDP, and it's broken out in a huge way. And of course, you have the stock market selling at a huge percentage of tangible equity. So a dollar invested in American business is producing, you know, three dollars or so uh, or more in, in market value. That that cannot be regarded as a broken capitalistic system. And, and let me—that's why Warren, I started off the way I did because in asking you your, your judgment in terms of what was going to be the longer-term impact of the changes. And you gave a very good uh, description of, 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 you know, of, of how you thought it was working, uh, you know, how you 
the, the cost associated with, with, with some of the rules, the, 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 the time that boards were spending, and, and so on. If you were to, to, to look down the road a few years, how, how would you guess that this would, would, would shake out over time? I think American business will be very ingenious about learning how to cope with almost anything that comes its way. I mean, you know, whether it's during a World War II, you name it. I mean, uh, we have a system that's a market system that's that's worked very well over over the years. And and uh, you, know, you can take Jamie's banking industry, and you know, there are a number of banks that that are earning well over 20 percent on. On tangible equity in a in a world where long bonds are four and a half percent, you can't say that American business is, you know, not not getting its share of the national pie when those circumstances exist. And that, uh, you know, a lot of that's just due to the system we live in, and a lot of it's due to good management, and probably a lot of it's due to luck. <laughs> yeah, so I, it's a, a little bit off the track, but I think it's very important for this country, and it's it's not directly related to this, but it's directly related to American competitiveness. We need, as a country, good, nonpartisan politics. We need an energy policy. We need an environmental policy. We need a pension policy. And they are really important. They're important for our citizens. They're important for our competitiveness. And yet, we don't. In fact, you saw a deal recently, uh, TXU, where you know, uh, private equity groups bought, buying uh, some, uh, an energy company with coal plants. And there's a big debate. And they had to go to, uh, and they did a very good job. They went to some environmentalists to get sign off. And I think that was good, they did a, a fine job, but it basically pointed out to me the lack of our own environmental policy, which is almost the same as energy. And you know, those things this country needs really badly and they're not partisan right now. But I would just make one other second request, and I, this is a historical thing, I think there's a, a trend that happens over time. If you read the papers and you listen to people on TV and stuff like that, hell, we don't trust anybody. I mean, no one, doctors, lawyers, accountants, business people, you name it. Uh, and so Paul's did this thing in the press that said that, that, 50, that almost no profession is over the 50% level now of trust. And uh, may, maybe firemen are the exception because they're only there to help sometimes. And, uh, and that ne it's never been like that in history before. Facts are misused. People, you know, I just think we need a higher level of debate in this country and a nonpartisan debate really looking at facts with, and ending up in good policy. And in fact, that's what we're doing right now. First of all, Jamie, I agree with you, but, but I want to go back to what Warren said, because I, I agree with what Warren said, that the U.S. capital markets and the U.S. Uh, economy and corporate earnings and, and, of course, the stock market all are very robust and actually are doing very, very well. And the U.S. has a great tendency to self-correct. And so on the implementation of 404, the SEC and the Public Accounting Oversight Board are already trying to correct that and make it uh, less burdensome while maintaining all the positives of it. On the uh, accounting side, the uh, SEC, again, is already talking about uh, accepting full IFRS, and there's a lot of uh, progress made on there. But there are some areas that we still need to make progress on. Litigation, tort reform, class action lawsuits is certainly one. Uh, the relationship between companies and their accountants and between the accountants and the SEC is another. And so, yes, the U.S. is in a very good spot right now, and yes, the, the markets are doing well, but we can still do better. Yep. And, 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 I think, and I think, John, that was one, one thing I took away, that the three areas we've picked, and, and none of them avail themselves to, you know, easy, quick fixes. And so that's what we, I think we really need to work on. It's not, it's, it's one thing to identify a problem, and it's another thing to figure out what to do about it. So we've got, that's one thing we've got. Uh, and, and you were. Just very quickly, I'd be remiss being up here as an investor advocate to not mention that I think as we're thinking about competitiveness here in the U.S., we need to be thinking about how competitive our investor rights are in the U.S. versus some other marketplaces. And the fact is that some non-U.S. marketplaces have rights for their investors that we don't have here. Majority voting for directors, advisory votes on executive pay, access to proxies to nominate directors. These are mandatory in some countries, and I think that we need to at least be considering those models and those, those aspects as we're considering these issues. I was just going to say, I, I, I uh, want to end the way we started, which is to say I don't come here today, or I, I don't think any of us do necessarily to advocate for a rollback of regulation. I think the burden is on us in the current set of rules to demonstrate exemplary behavior, and that's what we should do. 
I think it's a question for the commissioner or for other people, for, for you, Hank, is just a question of uh, how can we make them better, more balanced, and in the end so that the investor benefits. Yep. I think that's, uh, Jeff, I think that's a very good summary of our, of our panel today. And we're, we're on time. And uh, I, I, I thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay.